Professor Tahami, members of the council, guests and friends, on behalf of our board of trustees, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Um, I, I have an opportunity to make a reminder. We were, were chatting just before we came in here and we remarked that uh, it was obviously time to go in since all our members were leaving the, the uh, uh, reception and coming in to sit down. In most organizations, you can't get people away from the, the, the hors d'oeuvres. Uh, one of the wonderful things about this membership is they know their priorities and it's, it's, it's your address. And as we were uh, commenting on that, uh, Mr. Carpenter said, but you'll also notice that they're very good about leaving early. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, we haven't sufficiently disciplined our members to stay here until 10 minutes after 7 when the speaker is through, and there are a lot of reasons for this. And uh, having made that point about the importance of saying, uh, staying, uh, Professor Friedman was in our little group, and he said, well, I have to leave early tonight. <laughs> Claim, and, he, and he shouts from the audience to teach. So he, had a, he has a good reason. But it, it is an opportunity to remind you that whenever possible, uh, if indeed we all could stay until 10 after 7, that would be a wonderful courtesy to our, our guests. That uses up my time for an introduction of the speaker. <laughs> but I am obliged to, uh, to thank uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, electronic sensors and systems for this evening's reception. And, and, and especially uh, its president, Lloyd Carpenter. Let me also remind you that uh, the cable rebroadcast is being sponsored by the University of Maryland College Park. And uh, we thank uh, the university and President Dan Mote uh, especially. Our next program is only 15 days from tonight in the same room on the 21st of October, John Bolton, who is a former Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations and now the Senior VP for Public Policy Research at the American Enterprise Institute, will speak on the uh, today most interesting topic of international law and American sovereignty. Our topic for tonight is the Arab-Israeli conflict, why the end is near. Uh, that optimistic uh, view uh, is perhaps appropriate for someone who holds the Anwar Sadat chair for international peace and development. Uh, for many, many people see Sadat as being responsible for a broad historical current moving inevitably and inexorably in that direction. I should note that the uh, Sadat program at College Park is a wonderful one. They have a great lecture series. Uh, uh, President uh, Weitzman of, of Israel spoke in his inaugural address, I believe. Jimmy Carter has spoken there. The, uh, uh, there's also a Sadat program with Brookings Institution, which brings together serious scholars on the Middle East to discuss these problems of, of uh, conflict resolution. And in noting that, it's part of the larger center for international uh, development and uh, conflict management at the university. And by the way, I, uh, I believe that uh, the Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, uh, Dean Goldstein, is with us tonight, and uh, Professor uh, uh, Wilkenfeld, who's the Chairman of the Government and Politics Department, uh, has also come with you this evening. We welcome them. Professor uh, Tahami is, is uh, a nicely established authority in his field, needless to say. He's a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley. He's taught at uh, premier institutions in the United States. He's taught at Columbia and at uh, Swarthmore, uh, at Princeton, uh, and at Berkeley. And in mentioning this in our conversation also, uh, I'm reminded, and also the University of Maryland, speaking of premier institutions within the country. <laughs> The, uh, the last position which was held by uh, Professor Tahami before coming to Maryland to hold the Sadat chair was as associate professor and uh, head of the Near Eastern Studies program at, at Cornell. Uh, 
He's published several works of, of, uh, of note. Um, I won't list them now. I would only like to also note that his experience in practical politics is, uh, is uh, real. He's uh, served on commissions which have been a, a legitimate and important part of the peace process in the Middle East. And he also has been a commentator on the elite in the uh, elite journals of the United States. Uh, he has a weekly radio broadcast uh, that is heard in most of the Middle East. Uh, in short, he brings together his serious scholarship, uh, practical involvement, and, uh, and commentary. It's my great pleasure to present to you Professor Shibley Tahami. Thank you. It's uh, really a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, I've always uh, was uh, impressed with this town. I discovered this town. I live only in, in Silver Spring. I've been here for two years. And, uh, uh, you know, you tend in the Washington area to think that Baltimore is somewhere out there on the moon. But uh, uh, once uh, we discovered this town, we, we see why you all live here and uh, why you all active in, in this particular institution. Um, when I arrived here um, uh, at the reception, uh, I noticed there were two gentlemen uh, in the crowd who had uh, apparently heard me speak recently on this very subject. And they came to me and said, uh, I see you're optimistic, so this must not be the same talk that you gave at this other place. Um, <laughs> and um, in fact, it is kind of an interesting point to make because um, being optimistic uh, uh, may not necessarily be good. Uh, let me uh, sort of uh, start with a... Uh, and the impressions that I used to have of Palestinians and Israelis every time I go to the Middle East and try to find out what the prospects of resolution uh, are, and I would come back with the same conclusion, and I'd speak out and I'd say, I come back that Israelis and Palestinians are equally divided between optimists and pessimists. The only problem is that the pessimists are uh, uh, fearful that the peace process is going to fall apart, and the optimists are hopeful that the peace process is going to fall <laughs> apart. Um, um, I think uh, at the moment, uh, uh, that's not what I mean by optimism. Uh, I do mean genuine optimism. And there is no question that uh, today when you go to the Middle East, when you go to Israel, when you go to the Palestinian territories, despite all the suspicions and the skepticism, there is definitely a new wave of optimism. There is pessimism too. But there is definitely a new wave of optimism, and I think it's justified. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is, in, it's briefly, give you kind of a sense of review of why there is, this is a moment of optimism, despite all the problems. And put it in a context, and leave a lot of questions unanswered so that we can engage each other in the questions and answers. Um, on the surface, actually, there's a lot of reason to be pessimistic, and let's not... Uh, avoid that. Uh, if you hear the news of the past week, uh, mixed with an agreement on opening a passage from, from Gaza to the West Bank, which was good news, uh, there was a lot of tension on Jerusalem. The issue of Jerusalem in the past couple of weeks has been a highly uh, uh, intense issue, with the Israeli Prime Minister making uh, uh, strong statements about uh, Israel uh, controlling Jerusalem forever, the Palestinians and making statements about uh, the East Jerusalem being part of a uh, Palestinian state. Uh, the, the Disney uh, exhibit uh, in Florida, which is open, which has been controversial in highlighting Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Uh, the Arab League threatening boycotts in the same way that we've heard in the past uh, over this issue. Uh, we've heard statements on settlements uh, from both sides that were, were problematic. And then when you look actually at the juncture of the negotiations, uh, you look ahead, and these guys have spent months since the election of the current prime minister negotiating over implementing an agreement which had been reached by the previous government, and they have, they're just beginning to do that now, and yet they have put on paper that they're supposed to finish in one year between now and September every single major issue that has separated the Palestinians and Israelis in the past 50 years. Uh, uh, the Oslo Accords that have taken six years to implement and have not been fully implemented uh, 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 really were not about major issues of conflict. The major issues of conflict were uh, the question of sovereignty, the question of Israeli security, the question of Jerusalem, the question of settlements, the question of refugees, all these tough issues, none of them 
have been resolved. And these guys say now they're going to sit and resolve these issues uh, by September in one year, even though they haven't, for the past months, haven't been able to do anything but look at, re-examine agreements they have already reached in the past over minor issues. So what's this optimism? And you can understand why there is a lot of pessimism among people. But that would be taking the wrong view of the conflict. I think you have to have, this is a century old conflict and it is finally winding down. And the biggest reason for optimism is really something that is not in the tangible position of the parties on these issues. I think when we think about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which is really the core of the Arab-Israeli conflict, a lot of people misunderstand historically what this conflict has been about. Um, people look at it and they say it's about religion. Well, it's not about religion. And if you think it's about religion, not only are you mistaken, but I think you're probably going to reach the wrong conclusions about the end of this conflict. You say it's about territory, and it certainly is about territory, no question about it. But it really is only secondarily about territory. This conflict, first and foremost, is about nationalism. It is about nationalism. And it is this issue that we have to come to grips with, its evolution over the past century, and where we stand at this juncture of Palestinian nationalism and Jewish nationalism, and why there is a moment of convergence, a moment of hope for resolving the tough issues ahead, and how this issue might inform us about how the parties can reach agreements on those specific issues. So allow me, if you don't mind, to come to review the question of nationalism a bit, Jewish nationalism and Palestinian nationalism, to just remind you of the thrust of these movements that are now converging uh, together historically. When you think about the Oslo Accords, which generated tremendous amount of hope in 1993, uh, in fact, the Oslo Accords were troubling accords. They were messy. As I suggested, they didn't deal with the core issues. Uh, they were not negotiated very well. They left a lot of details. They, were, they had a lot of problems. We now are experiencing and fixing some of the problems that came out of the Oslo Accords. But there was one thing that the Oslo Accords did that was promising. And that, and that was not so much in the actual agreement that was signed at the White House on September, uh, in September uh, 1993, but rather in something much simpler that just preceded the signing of those accords. There were very short letters of exchange from Yasser Arafat, the chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, and the Prime Minister of Israel, the late Yitzhak Rabin. They were short in fact, to the point of being one paragraph letters in which Mr. Rabin wrote to Mr. Arafat saying, I hereby inform you that the government of Israel recognizes the Palestine Liberation Organization as, quote, the representative of the Palestinian people, as a people, this entity in the diaspora, as a people. And Arafat sent a letter recognizing the state of Israel as a, defined as a Jewish state. Now that is a historical moment because we have to understand how this conflict emerged. When you look back, we often forget, particularly for those who look at the history of Zionism and now with uh, uh, a version or, or, or some form of the Zionism married to uh, religion, one tends to think that this is really at the, core of the, at the core of the Zionist movement. But when you look in the late 19th century, a century ago, when we had Zionism emerge as a political movement in Europe, it is very obvious that the fathers of Zionism were neither religious nor were motivated by religious faith and theology in advocating Zionism. This was a nationalist political movement that emerged out of a problem, a problem that had to do with the environment in which Jews existed in Europe. 
In fact, most of these Zionist fathers, uh, Theodore Herzl among them, were of the assimilated type. They were the, 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 the stereotypical assimilated Jew of Europe who ideally wanted to believe that the world is an egalitarian world, that nationalism is not a problem, that Jews could be like all other people and can exist in Europe as equals with non-Jews. Uh, this was the hope of the French Revolution. This is what most people believed. And this is what a lot of Jewish intellectuals believe. And that is what they chose. Herzl was a typical one among those Jewish Zionist fathers. And yet, there was the depressing reality in Europe in the late 19th century. And it was not in egalitarian Europe. It was in nationalist Europe, sometimes ethno-nationalist. And Jews were singled out. They were discriminated against. They did not live as equals in many parts of Europe. And so their conclusion was very simple. The world in which they live is a world of nationalism. And to attain equality, which was really what drove those intellectuals, to attain equality in this world, you have to have a nationalism of your own, in a state of your own. It's a, it's a conclusion that was a pragmatic conclusion. It was not a theological conclusion. And as you know, in fact, early Zionism was rejected by many religious fathers. This was a nationalist movement. Well, when you look at the rise of the Palestinian movement and you find something parallel, there are huge differences between the history of Palestinian nationalism and Jewish nationalism, different environments, different histories. But there was one sense in which there was a lot of similarity. And that sense is this. When the Palestinian problem emerged in 1948, when the Palestinians became refugees, homeless refugees, scattered in the Arab world, their movement was not about nationalism. Their movement was not about religion. Their movement was about the right of return to their homes. It was not a nationalist movement as such. It was a movement that was driven by the quest to return to their homes. And in that context, later on, many advocated pan-Arabism, which was broader than Palestinian nationalism, as a means of achieving this right of return, particularly when you had the pan-Arab movement being popular and powerful in the Middle East in the 1950s. And yet, decade after decade of disappointment brought home to the Palestinians that the world in which they lived ultimately was not an egalitarian world. It was not a world of pan-Arabism either. It was really a world of nation states. Yes, Egypt advocated pan-Arabism. Syria advocated pan-Arabism. But the truth of the matter is, state interests came first. It is a world of states in the Middle East, a world of nation states in the Middle East. And the Palestinians paid a price. And by the late 60s, early 70s, the Palestinians reach a similar conclusion, which was, in order for them to achieve some equality in the world, in the Middle East, they have to have a nationalism of their own and a homeland of their own. It was a transformation of the priorities from a right of return to the need to have a state, to accommodate, to have a sense of identity, to be equal with everybody else in the Middle East. It was very similar to the conclusion of Jews. The tragedy, or some of the tragedy, of the Arab-Israeli conflict is that when you had, in fact, the early decades of the conflict between 1948 and the late 60s, uh, what you had was you had a liberal Zionism, which was more pragmatic, more nationalistic, less territorial, less ideological. And therefore, there was room for concessions. But on the other side, you had the Palestinians driven less by nationalism and more by the right of return. And the right of return is irreconcilable with the state of Israel as a Jewish state. I mean, if you have Palestinians return to Israel, there'll be a majority. And you wouldn't have a Jewish state, and you wouldn't have Jewish nationalism. So the game between Israel, even Israel led by uh, uh, leaders who are more liberal than came to power later on uh, uh, was really a zero-sum game. It was irreconcilable positions. You couldn't have a solution 
in that, in that arena. Well, by the mid-70s, Palestinian nationalism emerged. And in 1974, with that emergence, there was the emergence of the PLO, recognized first by the Arab League in 74 as the representative of the Palestinian people, and then by the rest of the international community. And with that recognition, there was a shift in priorities of a pragmatic national movement whose aim is less the right of return and more the establishment of a state on part of Palestine. When that emerged, by the time the PLO and the new agenda was emerging, and I, I wouldn't say a full transformation, but partially taken place, you had the rise of revisionist Zionism in Israel with the, with the advent of Menachem Begin uh, in Israel, a Zionism which was more territorial, more ideological, had less in common, less room for maneuver with Palestinians, with their agenda, even the more limited agenda that some of them developed. And so I would put forth to you that the Oslo Accords, if you look at them historically, happened in a rare window of opportunity where you had a more pragmatic, and I say more pragmatic, Palestinian national movement in the context of which there was a possibility of sharing the land. And for the first time, really, after the emergence of that movement, the emergence of a liberal Zionist Israeli government for the first time since the mid-70s because the, the, the Labor Party which represented that, that school of thought in Israel really had not been alone in power since the mid-70s until the election of Yitzhak Rabin as Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, uh, and that was the window of opportunity, of, of coincidence. Obviously, I don't want to dwell on the circumstances that led to the Oslo Accords. I invite questions. There were a lot of huge changes, including the end of the Cold War, no small thing, and in between the Intifada and, and, and the Iraq War. But certainly, no one can explain what transpired unless you explain the leadership on both sides at that moment to exploit that moment of opportunity that emerged. And it is for that reason, ladies and gentlemen, that I think that agreement was historical, was important, was fundamental. It is coming to grips, coming to grips with the fact that there is a Jewish national movement that is expressing itself in the state of Israel. The fact that the Palestinians are not just residents of Sumeria and Gaza, but they are a people who see themselves as a political entity with, with political rights. That is not a small thing, because for a long time, as you know, the, in the Arab world, people did not see legitimate Jewish nationalism. They looked at Jews as a religion. And, and, and when Jews said, but we have political aspirations as a people, a lot of people dismissed that. And as you know, Zionism was defined even as a racist movement. And in fact, Arabs pushed for it to be passed in the UN that way. And you can see the sensitivity if you're a Jew when that happens. Well, on the other side, the Israelis rejected that there was such a thing as a Palestinian people. Even in the Camp David Accords, in a, a text of the Accords, when Menachem Begin actually signed an agreement where the text specified or referred to Palestinian people for the first time, Menachem Begin insisted on a letter from President Carter that would be an annex to the agreement in which he, uh, Carter expressed his understanding that Menachem Begin interpreted this phrase, Palestinian people, to, ref to, to refer to, quote, Arab residents of Judea, Sumeria, and Gaza. Uh, so, you know, the, the essentially to take the, the meaning out of it. Well, this is a historical leap that took place in Oslo. Now, something else happened with that leap. Once the PLO and Israel were seen to be on the road for reconciliation, everybody in the region knew that this conflict is coming to an end because clearly the Palestinian-Israeli conflict has been the core of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And that sent a signal of inevitability of peace and sent a signal of maneuvering by other states to want to exploit that possibility. There was an aura. There was, a, there was a psychology of peace that emerged. 
That psychology was reversed when Mr. Netanyahu came to power because he certainly had a different approach. Um, uh, whether you agree with him or not, it certainly was a different approach. And uh, there was a reversal. With, with the election of Mr. Barack, we certainly have a uh, revival of this agreement, this handshake that took place between Israeli leaders and the PLO in 1993. That handshake is meaningful because it is going to frame addressing some of the difficult issues that remain. And let me, in the few minutes that remain, tell you how I think this issue of nationalism at the core of this conflict can inform us about how they're likely to address some of these difficult issues in the next year. Let me begin with the issue of refugees, which, as you know, is a huge issue. There are hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees. They're scattered uh, in, in uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, all over the place. And many of them don't have citizenships in states where they are. They're homeless refugees uh, to this day. And clearly, their, their, their issue has to be settled. Well, there are, you have two extreme views. You have people who are demanding that those be returned to their homes in Israel, the original homes. And you have people who are saying they should be settled completely where they live now as a refugee problem. Neither of these options is possible. And if anybody believes that either of these options is possible, one does not understand the conflict and the concept of nationalism. Let's be very plain about the red lines that each side has in the context of their national movement. There is no way that any Israeli government, whether it's a left government or right government or any government, will agree to massive Palestinian return to pre-1967 Israel. There is no way an Israeli government is going to give up a Jewish majority in what is going to be, remain and continue to be Israel. It is just inconceivable to me in any short term to, to contemplate that. It's just not possible. Uh, I mean, this is a national movement that is coming to fruition now, and it's just impossible with all the tragedies that come with that to contemplate that realistically. Well, there is a Palestinian red line, and that Palestinian red line is this. I cannot believe, I cannot imagine any Palestinian leader, no matter how liberal, how weak, to sign an agreement that would deprive a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza of the right to accept any Palestinian refugees from anywhere as citizens of that state. I cannot contemplate that as a realistic possibility. I don't think any leader can sign it. I don't think any leader can get away with it, even if they sign it. So you have those red lines. And the negotiations are going to be within those two red lines. How do you manage return of refugees to a Palestinian state on the West Bank and Gaza when it's established, while not upsetting or destabilizing uh, the economy and the politics in the short term? That is going to be the, the way this issue will be addressed. Let me briefly, and I personally, frankly, do not think that this is going to be the biggest obstacle in the negotiations. I think the refugee question, which is very important, is going to be uh, e easier than some of the others. Now, let me come to uh, one of the seemingly most difficult questions in the negotiations, and that is the question of Jerusalem. Now, here, um, Anybody who knows anything about the conflict knows how important this city is to both sides. And the importance of this city to both sides is, in fact, the window through which religion and nationalism come together. And one has to come to grips with that. One has to come to grips with the depth of feelings on both sides. If you recall, those of you who are historians or, or who have been students of, of Zionism in the late 19th century, uh, some secular Zionists even contemplated the possibility of a state outside of Palestine for the Jews, even in Latin America and places like that. But that had to be rejected very quickly, because in order to mobilize a people, you have to touch the soul of a people. And frankly, everybody knows the role that Jerusalem plays in Jewish life. Historically, before even the rise of nationalism, 
Ethnic life, even more than uh, religious life, uh, next year in Jerusalem, is not something that was coined in the 19th century. It was something that has been coined for centuries. It is an important symbol that mobilized the people and created a reference that linked nationalism to a history, to a tradition, to a religion. Well, on the Palestinian and Arab side, Jerusalem has a very similar meaning. For Palestinians, Jerusalem has been the hub, the cultural heart. That's where most of the intellectual, the leaders, the, the symbols, the history, the wars historically have been over that one city. And so it's extremely important for both sides. And in fact, Jerusalem is really bigger than the Palestinian question on the Arab side. Uh, people may reject a Palestinian state and still defend Arab or Muslim control of Jerusalem. It is an issue we saw in the past couple of weeks, how it mobilized, even an exhibit in Disney, even in this environment of negotiations, it mobilized the public. Last week there was a, a survey among Palestinians, asked Palestinians, what if Jerusalem was the only obstacle to receiving an independent Palestinian state? Would you give Israel full sovereignty over Jerusalem? if you got in return fully independent Palestinian state. Over 90% of the Palestinians said no. In Israel, on left and right, there's also a consensus on the question of Jerusalem. Now you might start asking, what optimism are you projecting on this question? <laughs> and uh, clearly, this is an issue where there are red lines. And in fact, I could tell you what the red lines are in my mind. No Israeli government that I know is between now and September of this coming year, this year during the final status negotiations, is going to give up the claim, is going to sign off on anybody's sovereignty on any part of Jerusalem as Israel has defined it. It's just not going to happen. I mean, that's realism. On the Palestinian side, there's also a similar red line, and I think one should not delude themselves on this issue. There is no Palestinian le leader, no, not Arafat, not anybody else, who is willing to sign off on full Israeli sovereignty over the walled city of Jerusalem. And I say the walled city of Jerusalem because, frankly, that is what Jerusalem is. It's, that's where the holy places are. We can, you can't call Bethesda Washington, and there are people who are contemplating that. But it is very clear no one can do that. And in that sense, then, where's the room for a solution in the next year? I think both sides know what has to be done. Sovereignty is a major issue, but frankly, it's more symbolic than practical in the short term. The only way to negotiate Jerusalem is to decouple sovereignty from functional questions. You can take sovereignty and say, let's postpone dealing with sovereignty, but let's, feel with, 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 let's deal with facts on the grounds. What do you want? Palestinians want access to the city, free access to the city. They want also rights of residency in the city. Because for Palestinians, even if they happen to be uh, uh, residents of, of, of Nablus or Ramallah, uh, they culturally, historically, politically may yearn to be residents of Jerusalem even if it's outside their sovereign authority. And there has to be, Jerusalem is too important of an issue. You have to create some kind of uh, formula to maintain a certain cultural demographic balance in the city. And in the context of that formula, certain residency rights could be provided. You can have municipal solutions. You could even have uh, uh, solutions for the question of location of Palestinian parliament. But those practical questions, which I think are addressable, and in fact negotiators have done informal negotiations over them, and I think solutions are within reach, are not questions of sovereignty. The question of sovereignty will have to be postponed. A third point that I will make is on settlements. Realistically, the consensus is that some settlements are going to have to go, and some settlements are going to have to stay. And the big question will be is which ones are going to have to go and which ones are going to have to stay. And this is a huge issue for both sides. This, in, to me, is the biggest obstacle 
in the negotiations. The most difficult question, because here you are talking about relocation of populations. And when you're talking about that politically, it's a very difficult issue for both sides. And as a consequence, I think that the, actually the crux, the most difficult part of the time that is, the, the thing that's going to be consuming, time consuming over the next few months, will be the settlement issue and the border issue. That's where the problem is going to be. Less Jerusalem and less refugees. Those are more solvable issues. But solvable they are. I think what you have now is a conclusions on both sides that are important conclusions. Conclusion number one is that neither side has the capacity to solve the problem unilaterally. The Palestinians cannot dictate their way by power, and the Israelis cannot dictate their way by power. They've tried that. It didn't work. They've got to come together. Number two, they understand that this is a historic opportunity. You have liberal leaders who know each other, who are now are in a position to make a deal. They know what happened to Rabin. They know how close these windows of opportunity uh, 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 close. And they also know that they have a timetable, and that is September. If they don't reach some kind of agreement, they both are going to be in trouble. Their political futures, and maybe more, is at stake. I think they will make it. When you look at the broad Arab-Israeli conflict, clearly the Palestinian-Israeli issue is the core. But you have the Syrian-Israeli conflict and the Lebanese-Israeli conflict, which is really a corollary to the Syrian-Israeli conflict. There, although we haven't seen much movement on the front, frankly, I think that issue is much easier to address. Here, most parties know exactly what has to be done. And they're pretty much there. What's missing is a political will. They have to make the political decisions. They have to bite the hard bite. And they have to clinch it. Once they agree to do so, I don't think it would take too long. And I think both sides are having a sense, again, of how quick these windows close. The laborites in the Rabin Paris era used to think they have indefinite time. And Rabin went, and Netanyahu got elected, and they lost it. And so did the Arabs. The Syrians believed that there was no difference between Rabin and Netanyahu. And they were shocked when Rabin was assassinated. And they know better now. And they were taking a different attitude. Actually, when one of the promising things, if you're a student of Arab-Israeli conflict, and you know the history of the rhetoric, you know how Arabs dealt with Israel as that Zionist entity, illegitimate, how uh, would, they wouldn't even mention the term Israel. They wouldn't even mention uh, 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 Israeli leaders by name. And how the Israelis also demonized uh, uh, Arab states and Arab leaders over time. It's now surprising to see a state we consider radical, the Syri Syria, uh, the, uh, Assad, President Assad, uh, making remarks uh, complimentary of Mr. Barak, calling him a an admirable leader, as someone he can work with, saying positive thing about him, and vice versa. You hear that today in the discourse. We have a different arena. There is a lot of ugliness in the discourse, for sure, still. Too much of it on both sides. But if you have a sense of history, uh, there is a lot of promise. The discourse has changed. The psyche has changed. And today, for example, the most important Arab uh, television station which broadcast by satellite, the one that is listened, uh, watched by most people from Morocco to Iraq and Saudi Arabia. It's called Al Jazeera TV. That television station, the most influential television station in the Arab world today, has a correspondent in the Israeli Knesset broadcasting domestic Israeli politics to the homes in Riyadh and Yemen and elsewhere. Many Arabs in the Gulf, by the way, know Israeli parliamentarians better than they know Saudi parliamentarians or Egyptian parliamentarians or Jordanian parliamentarians. It's a very surprising new world that has emerged. Let me end uh, with a note to go back to religion. I think religion is an important factor. Uh, I did uh, suggest to you that it's not the central factor. Uh, I suggested that it certainly is important in Jerusalem. Um, I also think that we have been at fault, and especially in the academy, in the American academy, we have been sort of lazy analysts. And we have allowed too much of the interpretation of this conflict and 
of, of culture and, and politics in general in the Middle East to be colored by this uh, obsession with the uh, mysterious uh, elements that we can't understand very well. Uh, we, we think of Islam as being something fundamentally different and we can't deal with and so therefore we can come up with uh, theological interpretations that may uh, alleviate our uh, dissonance about not understanding or coming to grips with, with facts. And we allow ourselves to be uh, sort of uh, 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 taken by explanations that look at the external garb, uh, sometimes literally the clothing and, and the, the, the uh, different culture and religion as the explanations for this conflict. That is a mistake I suggest to you. And I suggest to you that there is a lot more in common and there will be a lot more in common between Jews and Muslims religiously, but also between Arabs and Israelis uh, politically between Palestinians and Israelis than we can now see superficially. And on that, I want to end with a personal note, uh, just to, um, uh, to uh, come back to Mr. Byrd's uh, reference to all these so-called imp impressive institutions in which I taught. And I want to bring this uh, personal note to uh, sort of uh, bring, me, bring you with me to, down to reality about how people think. Uh, I must say that um, I have been in this country since I was 19. Um, I did all of my high school outside, and I came here and did all of my education in this country. And although I grew, in a little, grew up in a little village um, uh, where I certainly lived with Jews and Druze and Muslims and Christians, and I had, did not differentiate between them, they were all my classmates, uh, um, having spent time here, I somehow am taken to by the garb sometimes and don't know how to react to it. And, and in the village where I grew up, most of the people are Druze. Uh, my family is not, but most of the people in the village were Druze. The Druze are a very puritanical sect. Uh, the derivatives of Islam, but they have an independent religion, a very hospitable and warm people uh, who are uh, uh, traditional. Uh, they uh, uh, take pride in maintaining their culture and heritage. Uh, the religious among them look like the Ayatollah Khomeini. They wear uh, long robes, long white beards, uh, turbans. They're puritanical in the sense that they're not supposed to listen to music. They certainly don't drink and smoke. Uh, uh, music uh, is, is supposed to be too much of pleasures of, 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 of the world and so forth. And when you look at them, uh, if you don't know, particularly if there's a language barrier, you might say, what do I have in common with this person? Well, I should know better because many of these people who now, you know, are clothed like that were actually my classmates. I, I'd hate to think that I have white beard, but I'm sure if I were allowed, allowed my, my, my beard to grow, I probably would have a white beard. Um, but I want, I, every time I go back uh, to the village to visit, it's a village um, near the city of Haifa, um, I would have a welcoming committee, and, and the first to, uh, to come would be the, the, the religious elderly among the Druze, who are, they come as a committee, they're very serious, very sober, uh, very proper, and they come to welcome this old villager who comes back and to you know, ask me about what I'm doing. And, and usually they don't know much about academics, so it's hard for me to impress them by saying I'm a professor at some place. Um, at the time, I was teaching at one of the so-called impressive institutions, Princeton, which isn't as impressive as the University of Maryland, but nonetheless not a bad place. <laughs> um, um, I, um, I went there and, and they said, what are you doing now? And I said, uh, well, I'm teaching at this university. It's near New York. It's really a good university. And it's not that easy to get a job there. Uh, it's called Princeton. And I see their eyes light up, and they stand up with excitement. And they say, Princeton, yes, yes, that's where Brooke Shields went to school. Well, on this note, let me end with an optimistic conclusion. Uh, we will have peace. We will have peace. Thank you very much. Here the question is, um, you've had all these changes in Israeli leadership over time, and Arafat has been the main, the only Palestinian leader really since 1968, pretty much. Uh, and so what happens now with his health deteriorating? What ha what's after Arafat? Now, it's interesting, actually, to think of Arafat and his role. I mean, Arafat is important 
not simply because he's a leader of a Palestinian people. He's not important in the same way that Mubarak is important or Assad is important. He's important in that way, but there is something else about Arafat. Arafat has been a symbol of Palestinian nationalism. He's been a flag. He's been the international legitimacy, the embodiment of the Palestinian struggle. So in that sense, um, he is very, very important. And weakened as he is, and he's significantly weakened, you know, uh, one has to come to grips with that. Uh, today in the Palestinian territories, uh, when you take a poll, and there was one taken two weeks ago about his popularity, his popularity is down to 38 uh, percent. And that's among, you know, among the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And that is not because of the peace process. Over 70 percent of the same Palestinians who are polled support the peace process. So they are making judgment also on governance. He's now a governor as well as a, a figure of Palestinian nationalism, as well as a negotiator on behalf of the Palestinian. He's wearing multiple hats. He's uh, representing the Palestinians in the refugee camps, but he's the head of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, he's wearing many hats. And for that reason, in this year, with the deadline that we have, probably no other leader could deliver an agreement than Arafat. He's still the central figure, and it would be very hard to contemplate that. In the long term, I don't think he's particularly important. Uh, I think the Palestinians develop, uh, develop institutions that can come up with alternatives. Uh, ultimately, there will be a need for somebody else with the new generation in any case. Uh, uh, it just takes time for any leader to gain the credibility that would allow him to make the required concessions in this struggle. And so in the short term, he's essential. In the long term, I really do not fear for the ultimate change that is inevitable, probably sooner than later, in the Palestinian community. The, the question was about the, the economic viability of a Palestinian state. By the way, I, I must tell you that um, in 1946, 47, 48, when uh, the question of a Jewish state was being contemplated, many British diplomats and many within the American bureaucratic community rejected it on the basis that it was not a viable state. I mean, just to put that in, in sort of historical perspective. And today, Israel, by the way, is uh, um, richer than it has a larger GNP than Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and the Palestinian territories put together. That is a population of um, over 70, 80 million people. And Israel has got 6 million people. So imagine what the per capita income discrepancy is between the two. So uh, it's just to put things in historical perspective. Uh, I don't say that the Palestinian, a Palestinian state would not have uh, difficulty. Uh, it probably would not have much more difficulty than many other small states, and probably has very major advantages. One of the major advantages is it is next to and linked to and probably will be uh, uh, engaged in, uh, engaged with a state that, is, that has a, a dynamic economy, and that is Israel. They're going to have to have a relationship. This is not going to be a fence on the economic realm. It can't be. Frankly, Egypt, uh, I mean, uh, Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinians are going to have to reach some economic accommodations uh, that will help all three, and that is what, what is being contemplated. Uh, but the Palestinians have a lot of resources outside. There's a lot of Palestinian uh, uh, diaspora that is uh, moneyed and successful, that has been awaiting the moment when to, to go back and invest. Uh, there's a lot of educated Palestinians on the outside who would, who would come back in. You're likely to have uh, significant tourism. Um, uh, just because of the location and the history. Bethlehem uh, will be in, in Palestine. Uh, so um, th there are reasons to think that it should fare possibly better than many states. Not probably very, very well, uh, but depending on how they perform. Uh, you are going to need uh, certainly better leadership, and, uh, uh, but being small size as this state is might actually be an advantage rather than disadvantage in this case. The question is about the status of Jerusalem. Could it ever be an international city? As you know, Jerusalem has had this very, very interesting history. 
in international negotiations. The partition plan in 1947, which, you know, which recommended the partition of Palestine into a, an Arab state and a Jewish state, envisioned a unique status for Jerusalem, which would be an international city. Many states never took a position on Jerusalem. The Vatican clearly had a, you know, some say on, on what goes on and had a unique position on the internationalization of Jerusalem. The United States never took a position on either East or West Jerusalem. To this day, the U.S. has not taken the official position of changing its previous historical position, which was that the status of Jerusalem is going to have to be addressed somehow. But, but the U.S. never actually even recognized Israeli sovereignty over West Jerusalem, not just East Jerusalem, because of this unique case. Uh, personally, I don't see that as being a realistic thing. Uh, we don't have many good precedents in international relations. And it is too important of an issue to both Israelis and Palestinians. And once you start bringing in um, you know, Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Morocco and, and Jordan and the Vatican um, and, and so forth, it, it could become a much more difficult issue. Obviously, it has, everybody has to have uh, access to the city. But the question of sovereignty, uh, the questions of de facto control is going to have to be resolved differently. Uh, I think that uh, there will be a, um, uh, some interdependence, but there will have to be some other conventional solutions to this problem on the question of sovereignty, which I don't think will be resolved before September. Uh, the question is about the report that King Abdullah is uh, 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 willing to accommodate Palestinians in Jordan uh, and as asking on other Arabs to do the same rather than have them return uh, to Palestine. Um, first of all, these are, these are reports, and we don't know how true that is, and, and, and the nuances here are extremely important. Um, uh, and the reason for it is that historically, when you look at Jordan, Jordan actually has been one of the best countries on the question of refugees. Uh, it has pretty much offered every Palestinian the right of citizenship in Jordan, even though there has been some tension between uh, you know, Jordanians and Palestinians, particularly later uh, in 1970 and, and, and beyond. But uh, the truth of the matter is Jordan had always been one of the countries that offered the option of citizenship and passport to the Palestinians. So, so this is not new for, for Jordan. Jordan clearly also would like to be compensated for its settling of refugees in the past uh, in the context of this compensation. Jordan is a poor country. A lot of people don't know, by the way, that um, when the 300,000 Palestinians or so, were nearly quarter million maybe, from, were, were, were expelled from Kuwait recently, after the Gulf War in 1991, 92, uh, as a consequence of what transpired in the, in, the, in the Gulf War, most of these people went to Jordan and Jordan accommodated them. And even though Jordan's GNP had declined by nearly a third because of that war. So there is an economic problem and they need to, to, to they have paid a heavy price historically. They need to deal with that. But the truth of the matter is, I go back to one principle, which is this. This is not a refugee problem. This now is a Palestinian national problem. And it is hard for me to contemplate any Palestinian leader being able to give up the right of other Palestinians to come back to, the, to a limited state of Palestine he can persuade them on pragmatic grounds to give up the right to return to the original homes. But with the transformation of the conflict into a national conflict, I cannot believe, I cannot conceive of this as being possible for any Palestinian leader. Now, it may turn out, ultimately, that many Palestinians don't want to go back. And that is the case. As you know, many Zionists didn't go back to Israel. Uh, not every Zionist who, or every advocate of, of Jewish nationalism wanted to settle in Israel. But they wanted the identity settled that way, and there was a certain psychological comfort with the embodiment of Jewish nationalism in a state. Now, what will happen to those people who don't want to go back? Well, they must have options. And I think here, the U.S. will probably, and is already um, uh, making efforts to create additional options for those who don't want to go back. So that every state where refugees are already living and in some instances integrated would have the option to stay if they wanted to stay subject to quotas.
In Lebanon, for example, it's a major problem. Lebanon has a fragile demographic balance uh, with different ethnic and religious groups, uh, and the presence of a large number of Palestinians as citizens will alter that balance in a way that le most Lebanese feel uncomfortable with. So it might have to be a small quota. The U.S. may actually create a quota for pre presenting a certain number of, of immigration permits to Palestinians who want to come here instead of going back to their homes. So those are options, but not forced settlement. Forced settlement, no Palestinian leader can sign off on, in my judgment. I think it's a red line for them politically. Uh, I don't think they, they, they would survive such an agreement. The, the importance of Mecca versus Jerusalem. Um, there's no question that religiously, Mecca is the most important uh, uh, place for Islam. Now, you know, we have to, you said for Arabs, and I assume you mean for Islam, because you have to remember that many Arabs are not Muslim. Uh, but uh, the, for Islam, certainly, whether they're Arab or not, and most Muslims are not Arabs, right? The vast majority of the Muslim world not even Arab. Uh, uh, for, for Islam, Mecca is the most important uh, city, and Medina is, is the second most important. Uh, the, uh, Haram al-Sharif in, in Jerusalem is, is really the third most important uh, uh, mosque in, in Islam. But I could tell you it's very interesting. Um, Jerusalem has a, a psychological importance in the Muslim and Arab world. Um, I um, uh, was recently, I mean, we can see it, of course, in the discourse uh, of the last few weeks uh, in the Arab world about this boycott threat and so forth over uh, the, the Disney exhibit. But, I was in uh, Yemen over the summer for the first time. I'd never been to Yemen. Yemen is, as you know, um, um, uh, in, in uh, the, the southern end of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, when um, most people are, uh, it's one of the poorest countries in the Middle East. It's very remote from the heart of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And frankly, most Yemenis are not focused on foreign policy. I mean, let's face it, they mostly are uh, thinking about the daily bread and their domestic politics and, and, and so forth. Um, but one of the striking things to me is um, I uh, went to many institutions and many homes uh, and university uh, uh, rooms and, and faculty offices. And uh, what, what was striking was there was a single picture on the wall. And it wasn't of Mecca. It was of Jerusalem. And that tells you many stories about how psychologically important the city in the minds of many. We're absolutely delighted. It's a marvelous thing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. 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 Thanks.